Bow wow. Welcome to Dog Star. We are Sun Dogs, and this is KPW. Yes, yes, yo. What's happening? What's happening? Sun Dogs. It's been a while. Been a while. <laughs> a couple since years we... almost. I, yeah. yeah, I think uh, May fourteenth, twenty twenty one, on the on the old be, on the old exact. program. Yeah. yeah, the the attic and the couch. Exactly, <laughs> the couch exactly. and the attic. Which one is it? Yeah, we really appreciate you coming through. It. Sure. Uh, we've been excited, uh, almost uh, two years in the making. Yeah, been exactly. looking forward to it. I mean, uh, <laughs> been been planning around it all day. If uh, if yeah. you haven't listened to that or watched that episode, check that out. That's uh, Sundogs present local vibes. The KPW. old show. Yeah. Yes, yes. But thanks for blessing the Dog Star uh, sure. soundstage. For sure. For um, sure. It's, a, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, yeah, you're yeah. extremely knowledgeable Oof. about uh, a music career as you've lived it uh, for all these years. For sure. Um, I guess before we jump in all the way, uh, KPW on all streaming platforms. Correct. Uh, KPWhiphop.com. Mm-hmm. Yep. KPW hip hop on everything else. Everything else. Yeah. Uh, Social pro media signature wise. apparel on yeah. Instagram yeah. as well. My, right? man, my man got it down. All right. Cool. cool got cool. it down. Pat. <laughs> exact. It. Right and exact. Good, good. All right. So follow all that and then let's uh, dive in. Because sure. last time you were talking about, or last time you brought uh, Truth Be Told, that yep. uh, sweet Clang mm. collab. Yeah. That's Appreciate the one for the books for sure. Appreciate and then Where that. is God? which was off of G.O.D. and the Virgin. Yep. And that's what you were kind of hyping then. Yep. And so we've got, yeah, a it's lot of Paul, catching yeah, up to do. Got, there's a lot of material that's uh, come to fruition since then. Very cool. Yeah. So, uh, what? yeah, what have you been doing since then? Uh, God, Releasing G- stuff. Yeah, G.O.D. and the Virgin. How do you feel like the overall, because you've released a whole project since then. Since then, How did yeah. you feel that G.O.D. and the Virgin did as far as like what you wanted to do as a project just as far as as it compares to this most recent project yeah because i assume you had like the same vision or you wanted the same thing out of both obviously to Mm -hmm. like get good music to people who need to hear that Mm -hmm. music um but yeah what are what are what uh looking back on uh god and the virgin is there anything you would have done different i mean yes absolutely i think that for one my style definitely evolved on How so? this newest project. Well, God and the Virgin was it's actually God, you can say G O D. It doesn't really okay. doesn't really matter. G dash D. Whoa. I mean, technically <laughs> it's the it's how it's read. So <laughs> no yeah. wrong way. Um but God and the Virgin God and the Virgin is very complex lyrically. Mm-hmm. And what I came to fi- find out specifically with that project, I think that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back of people's patience level with the way I I used to rhyme. I shouldn't say the way I rhyme now, but the way I used to rhyme. Um, people aren't typically willing to sit through a super lyrically dense song from mm. beginning to end. And a lot of the feedback that I was getting wasn't necessarily bad mm-hmm. in terms of it being whack or anything like that. Right. I mean, people may think that. I never hear that. Right, know? right, right. Um, but... What I was getting a lot of was, you know, your content is very complex. I had one person tell me that they've never actually been able to make it through an entire song of mine for for reasons, you Whoa. know, among that. And, you know, that wasn't necessarily a bad thing because along with it would, would come a compliment of, yeah. you know, this is very thought-provoking, that type mm. of thing. But the reactions were also mixed because I would hear people tell me how how dense and how in depth the material was mm-hmm. you know how positive it was mm-hmm. which is always the common theme of course right um but one of the major takeaways was that that project i pushed a lot you know i put a lot of visuals out for it i think four to be exact maybe even five i don't even remember at this point um that was kind of the period where i developed the merch and did the best i've ever done with mm-hmm. merch as far as making hoodies and that type of thing yeah. and then along with that or shortly after that came pro signature mm-hmm. um but what I decided to do and what and just by kind of happenstance during the pandemic and having downtime and all that, that having been the most recent happening, that having happened to be the most recent project um, coinciding with the pandemic, giving me downtime. Mm. That's when I started to learn not only about what I know currently about the music business and you know publishing and licensing and all that other type mm. of stuff we were talking about last time but also 
focusing on the importance of song structure. Mm. Yeah. You know, and so long and long answer to a short question. The difference now with the material that I put out is that it's by no means dumbed down. I don't mm-hmm. like to call it dumbed down, but it's relatively more digestible. Yeah. Where do you draw the line between pandering and digestible? I mean, pandering to me would be not being true to yourself and making music strictly for other people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, doing something that you don't necessarily enjoy. You see that with a lot of label artists. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, just so that you can do what you think is going to appease other people. Mm-hmm. It's funny. I was uh, I was listening to an interview. Just so happens I was listening to an interview by uh, a major label artist mm-hmm. that I, I'm not going to say the name or anything like that, but um, that we all probably are somewhat familiar with an R&B artist who back about eight years ago changed, changed his image a little bit and kind of shifted into a, what we would call a different genre of music okay. and was getting heavily criticized for mm. it and was trying to explain on this on this platform that he was on that it was because he was trying to kind of shift the the approach of his music, not necessarily to kill his old identity, but to kind of mold into what was popular at the time. Mm-hmm. So it was okay. kind of more of like a trappy rap sound. And this was an R and B singer. Right. But it right. was more of a somewhat of a trap, trappy rap sound with auto tune and that type of thing. Mm-hmm. And the big criticism that the interview the interviewers were giving him was that, well, why are you using auto tune? you're a really good singer. Mm. And he's trying to explain, well, you know, I don't need to not know how to sing in order to use auto tune. Yeah. I'm mm. just trying to properly utilize it. You know, you're giving me a lot of flack. I'm paraphrasing, but yeah, you know, yeah, you're yeah. giving me a lot of flack, but you got to let me get there too. Mm-hmm. But the the fact of the matter is the reception just wasn't positive from oh. a lot of people. Wow. Right. And the takeaway that I, the, my takeaway from it was that, yeah, this person to me, doesn't seem like he's doing this for himself, Ooh. even though he might say he is. I don't know what the answer to that right, is. Right. Sure. I mean, he he's the only person that knows that that truth. And yeah. knows um, exactly where that line is between is he just making music that'll hit his like new target audience that he's established yeah. in his mind, right? Um, or is it? You know, is right. it still any part of him in the music or not? Right. And so I mean, the, like the, people the outside saying, perception no. could be to anybody who was used to his old stuff that, mm-hmm. you know, that's strictly a, a move to pander and conform. Mm. But who really knows? Who knows? But to your point, um, that would be an example of how somebody could perceive pander. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What uh, What do you think makes it? I mean, I don't know if it's an easy decision for you or not to like stay true to yourself versus like chase no, 100%, fans 100 percent. no easy, i mean easy it's decision. easy to stay true for my, to myself i mean i'm a i'm a really secure person what part yeah what makes it easy because i know a lot of people want to make money want to get famous would do literally anything yeah. to make it print having principles having principles and growth i mean i i was raised on principles so that's part of it that's just kind mm. of my natural fabric but, like um, religion or? not religion not just generally discipline Mm-hmm. Um, I was just never, I mean, part of my upbringing was a lot of fear instilled into me, oh, right. um, but you know, that gets, that got converted into confidence yeah. and, mm-hmm. um, value in staying true to myself and morals and things along yeah. those lines, not to be holier than thou, cause mm-hmm. you know, we all do janky stuff and none of us is beyond reproach, but it's just a matter of having practiced certain behaviors throughout my entire life, knowing what's most important, knowing that all money isn't good. I mean, Mm -hmm. selling out is never really the look in my eyes. You know what I mean? I mean, if you really think about it, certain amounts of money that may on the surface or may initially look like a lot or really not once you get to that point. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll hear a lot of millionaires tell you that. So is it really worth selling yourself selling out the people that you claim to have loved, people who held you down, that type of thing, in order to reach some level of notoriety Mm -hmm. or to attain a certain level of money. No. You know, I mean, ever since I was a teenager and I got to the point where I started writing rhymes and determined that I wanted to do the artistry thing, I've never wanted to be a major label signee. And -hmm. that's never changed. Wow. You know, so, I mean, I don't care how, I've never cared how long it's taken to, 
even gain a little bit of traction, mm-hmm. you know, to get 2,000 views on a, on a video for the first time and finally be excited about it while that's nothing to anybody else. You know, right. I've never cared whether or not the money that I make from it stayed incremental for a long time. Mm-hmm. And I got to the point where I'm in my late 30s and I'm finally starting to understand certain things that are important. I've never cared about that. And that's never, you know, that's never been a, that's never been a deterrent. Mm-hmm. You know, I've always just decided to stay true to myself and make my music the most authentic way that I can. Yeah. So, I, I mean, mean, that all helps me. Yeah. Less time worrying about that stuff gives you more mental energy to focus on the art. For sure. Yeah. And then you asked about digestibility. Um, studying. Just a lot of studying and learning what what really hits. Mm-hmm. Just as far as what is easy to listen to um, from a consumer standpoint. Yeah using certain consonants, for example, together and word combinations and that type of thing. Because when you uh, when you first start writing, at least I can't speak for y'all, but for me, when I first started writing, it was not, it was easy to underestimate how important a lot of that stuff really is, right? Mm-hmm. Totally. You might totally. you might start writing a, writing a song and think you kind of just fit a bunch of words together in, and then to segue into the next point, think that it can just go go over any beat mm-hmm. you know and that that goes to my <laughs> next point of i used to really underestimate the importance of of not being able to write to beats because i've always been able to do that but of writing to beats mm-hmm. and the distinction that you can make between a song that was written to an actual beat in a custom way and writing a song first and then worrying about making the beat later mm-hmm. you know because then you can actually conf- you know, not conform. You can um, customize the flow to the actual rhythm of the beat. Yeah. You know, you can uh, ride the beat a little bit differently than you would if you hadn't made it before, that mm-hmm. you made it later, that type of thing. Yeah. I really underestimated that. And a lot of, one of my big bragging points used to be, yeah, man, I write all my songs with no beats and I make my beats later. Yeah. Because I had friends who also rhymed who, who could never do that. Right. Mm-hmm. They didn't know how, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> It's a skill, I think, and it's a it's a strength. Definitely. But I think it can handicap you if you refuse to do it both ways or you mm-hmm. refuse to do it different ways. Right. So that's another thing that came along. Kinda and that makes it a lot more digestible for people. Kind of reminds right. me of uh, like a cowboy bebop type situation. I don't know if you ever watched that anime. I've heard of it. I've heard of it. I was watching this like documentary thing about it, how they would they'd write the music or they write the scene, the guy would write the music, but then it would go back to the animators to make it closer to the music, and then it would go back to the musicians to make it closer like the animation, just like... They kind of be boom, boom, back boom, boom, boom. And art. Yeah. So yeah. it's like, you can make the beat like skeleton, like yeah. basics. Yeah, and then customize and then write later it, on. And then add, because yeah, that it reminds me of that Clang collab that you brought last time. That man. I'll never forget that song. You know, it's funny. I was listening to the last interview last night. Ooh. Um, just because I wanted to kind of go back over what we were talking about with um certain sections of it. And then I got to that Clang part. And then I started thinking about how that came together. Yeah. Are you still how, working with him at all? I haven't talked to him in a while. Okay. Um, I'm still linked with him on social good, media and good. whatnot. But um, I have been linked up with several of those producers in probably mm-hmm. a couple of years i probably should but perfect example yeah very yeah. nice um yeah sounds interesting sorry for throwing you out oh, to uh, backtrack just a little bit you were talking about um you know being able to hone in lyrically what works what doesn't mm-hmm. work are you hiring out a focus group or getting trusted uh colleagues or family members to kind of nah, give you that nah, judgment how do you nah. know what hits how do you know what doesn't i mean i trust my own judgment yeah um but i do i mean to answer your, to hit on part of your question yes and no i mean yeah. i've got people that know music and that i might share with low-key before i release something or whatever but i mean i don't send this mass email right. out to a bunch of people to get a preview or anything mm-hmm. like that but I do get other perspectives. That's part of it. Yeah. Um, but the other part of it is just trusting my own judgment and then anticipating the feedback. Yeah, you're saying studying. Are you studying like who's content top 40 cre- in the content charts? Creators, or are you content studying, creators to talk um, about the content creators to talk about the the business. Oh yeah, um, and, and then the, uh, the but as far as the song writing or like making more digestible stuff, um, is that from? Are you like? looking to artists that you like to like find inspiration for like how to do that or like what do you I mean I've always done that 
mm. to a degree, but I think to, the answer is yes to your question. Um, and I think it's because when you, we may have talked about this last time, I don't remember if we did, but when you become an artist, you, you, it's, it's very difficult to remain a consumer, right? I it's, can attest. You know, like, yes. I don't, I don't, re I don't like to refer to memes, but I'm going to. It's, it's almost like that meme, if you guys have ever seen it, where <laughs> there was a, it was like a football player with a jersey on standing in the stands watching a football game. Mm. And the caption said, when you're an artist at a concert, Oof. right? <laughs> you can't, it's very hard to disengage from uh, creator mode. Yeah. When you're listening to somebody else's music, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Because you're listening it, you're listening to it from the perspective of, of a creator. Mm -hmm. When you hear when you hear the snare, you hear the kick, you hear how the beat was constructed or, or how the song was structured all together, yeah. you can't help but to think about that. Yeah. You can't help but to possibly picture a studio session mm -hmm. or see a set of waveforms, that type of thing. Yeah. It's very difficult to disengage from that and just be a consumer. Mm -hmm. You hear, mm -hmm. you hear mm -hmm. all the breaths in between <laughs> their, you know, their, lot, their bars and all yeah. that type of thing. A consumer, a, a somebody who's strictly a consumer of music who might not necessarily have any sort of musical inclination or talent or anything like that might not pick up on those things. Right, mm -hmm. could be looking you know? at a totally different performance than you are. Yeah, oh yeah. so to That's answer so that question, it's that comes with listening to the music, mm. um, particularly with people that you grew up on. But as you learn these things, it becomes magnified. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's more so now. It's a gift and a curse. It's a gift <laughs> yeah, and a curse. Totally, definitely. So I, got, like, oh, go continue. Ahead. I was going to say we only got like a minute left, and I wanted to jump back and ask you about uh, you're saying principles and like discipline, yeah. stuff like that. Is that like uh, like uh, you imitating that behavior from like a dope role model, or is like has your principles like been there for you during a hard time and that positive reinforcement? Both. Both. I mean, my upbringing was very strict, mm -hmm. so. I mean, a lot of that doesn't necessarily, uh, a lot of that upbringing doesn't necessarily incorporate any why, mm. but you might adjust as time goes on based on your Make life experience. Make it easier to set your own. Well, and to understand what, a, what works and what doesn't. Because understand, I mean, I didn't necessarily, I don't agree with everything that I grew up <laughs> on either. So I use what I take as valuable and mm -hmm. then just kind of discard everything that I didn't agree with. And I'll tell my parents that straight up. You know, <laughs> I, I, we talk all the time about that type of thing. But um, it's just a matter of understanding what's valuable to you. Um, and true. so those principles are not always easy to uphold. But if you're a real person, you're going to uphold them some way or the other. Words yeah. of wisdom here with we'll KPW. Right we'll be right back. And we're back. This is Dog Star. And we are sitting with the legend himself, <clears throat> KPW. Yes, yes. We were talking before Happening. the before the break, uh, kind of catching up. Yeah, you know, yeah. a lot to catch. I mean, two in, almost two years. Yeah, twenty twenty one already. Already. Yes. Yeah. The development of the songwriting, the, the, uh, of the evolution clothing of everything. Brand. Yeah. Yep. Yep. The Did activity that, in general. So, talk about a little bit about the clothing brand. Did that stem out just from <laughs> merch from the from the music? Yeah, I suppose like we didn't talk. Music we didn't spend a whole lot of time talking about that last time, did we? Yeah, how uh, did that decision come about? Very randomly, to be mm. honest. Basically, around the time that I I had just released "God in the Virgin" and was promoting a lot of that, I hadn't had a lot of except I hadn't had a lot of success with merch mm. until I printed these hoodies for "God in the Virgin." And those mm -hmm. were selling pretty crazy in um, person or online or both. Mostly in person. I don't think I sold any of those online. I had them online, but I think I sold most of them in person when I go to shows and I've been. Um, and it wouldn't <clears throat> necessarily always be shows I was performing at. But okay. It was just I, that good of a brand. That, yeah, well, that I, started, I started realizing how much people actually like hoodies. Yeah. Because the merch I had before that was basically just T-shirts. Hmm. And they wouldn't really do that well. I'd sell a couple here and there. Right. But I started selling out merch. And um, so one day... During the time that I was doing God in the Birds, my hair happened to be a little bit longer than it usually was. So I got a longer. little bit longer. <laughs> Not like it was the last time you right, saw me, right. but long, at the time, longer than usual. Okay. Um, and I got a haircut one day, and I decided 
documented because it had been a while since I got yeah. cut up. And I happened to take this really dope profile shot. So mm -hmm. I just started messing around with the silhouettes. And there were literally two different people that told me when I did this sil silhouette of just the profile of my face mm -hmm. with the beard and everything, the mm -hmm. short haircut, that I should put that on the shirt. Oh, and so I started experimenting with it and printed a couple up, mm -hmm. started selling them, and people loved them. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have a name for them yet, but the original design, one of the first designs was the profile silhouette of my head on the front and my signature in the back. Mm -hmm. And it's pro signature. That's so, that's so Or perfect. is it pro signature? Because mm -hmm. that was the first time I actually was under the pressure of signing the name KPW as a right. signature right. as opposed to my regular, yeah. my government name. Government or is name. it this face is my signature now? That's what I, that's what I thought it was. But it's like, uh, just like this is the signature. This go. is a pro signature. This Another is way to look my at face See? signs the checks. Perspectives. <laughs> Perspectives. <laughs> Well, I got, yeah, I got that's, one that's, in the that's other the room right story. now. I got, got the old See, black we, and camo, This is what man. we do, man. We take care of the people that we that we rock with. You know what I mean? Oof. Got two pro signatures in the uh, in the other room. Pro signature apparel, kpwhiphop.com. Don't miss out. Don't be the last one to get one, you know yeah, what I mean? Order you one up. We can get that on demand for you. So exactly. why do you think hoodies <laughs> did better than T-shirts? Just more unique, more versatile? I think or... people just like the comfort of them. Yeah. Um, I was I sell them in the summertime, in yeah. the spring. When it's, I mean, I wear hoodies at home. I get cold easily. And so. they wear hoodies in L.A., you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's like it's yeah. universal. Yeah. Never so, I mean, a bad I was, time to I wear. I was surprised, though. I was very surprised at how much of a liking people took to them just because of the fact that you know especially when i was just vending at events that i wasn't necessarily performing at there'd be people that come up look at my merch table buy one they hadn't even heard my music right wow. and a lot of them probably wow. didn't really particularly care to they just liked the way that the they designs looked, looked yeah you know? connected them even more with that show that experience again even yeah. if it well, you weren't performing they might not have even necessarily been sticking around for the music right because i mean a right. lot like right. one time for example it was a, a juneteenth event mm -hmm. in mankato a community yeah. event that a bunch of different vendors from that particular community were, were uh set up at and nice. i just happened to have a a table out there for the eight hours or whatever we were we were there um, and I was performing that day, but everybody wasn't necessarily there for music. Okay. You know what okay. I mean? So it it was one of many examples of the fact that people would just come up and impossibly buy a sweatshirt, yeah. which isn't a bad, which, that's no, not a problem yeah, for me. No. You know? all, all of a sudden, <laughs> you're a clothing brand designer, mm -hmm. man. And it's, it was, you, it's you a just, hit. You just fell into it, yeah. you know? Um, so I'm not, I haven't been making, actively making new designs mm -hmm. recently just because I don't want to stretch myself too thin. Yeah. But, the brand is there. Yes. Um, the website is active. It's it's my music website, yeah. but it's um, it's all sold on the merch tab. Cool. So, yes, it started, I think part of your question was, was it an extension of the music? It started mm -hmm. as merch. And yeah. sometimes I still call it merch. I should yeah. probably officialize that a little bit more, but mm -hmm. I extended it to a brand of its own. Yeah. And it's still an extension of my music mm -hmm. and my artistry, but it doesn't have to be. I mean, whoever yeah, wears both. one can just keep it completely separate because they like the brand pro signature. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. That's so cool. What a, su what a success story <laughs> with uh, the clothing, man. Uh, yeah. That's great. Big time. I mean, uh, uh, an artist, a creator, a business person of multi hats, of multi facets. Sure. Any tips to discipline, self discipline, or any good habits to someone who really really has the passion and has the know-how has the talent but needs to kind of get be a little bit harder on themselves yeah. any tips i mean to preface everything i mean i i would i would ask those questions myself just because i'm not you know like last time we were talking i don't particularly like to give advice on things i haven't fully right, um right. seen my greatest potential reach reach my peak on i should say mm -hmm. um but what i will say is just as far as my experience in my level of discipline and how i maintain it is to do hard things um i've been i've been challenging myself to do things that are uncomfortable okay. you know for okay. example every day almost every day i should say i take a cold shower mm. in the morning like i'm talking an ice Wim cold Huff. shower 
Huh? St- Wim Hof is that, style. Is that the is that That's the methodology? The I always forget he's the, the name. Co- he's the cold guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, yeah, he's running, he's Wim running Hawk. up mountains he's, he's, in his boxer shorts. I was like, what, what are you? What are y'all talking about? <laughs> he's the mi- mind over uh, matter guy. It's like I your think brain it's, can the make Wim, you. Wim Hof method. Wim, Wim, is what they call it or something? Yeah, something that's along the dude's those name, lines. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I looked. That. I kind of skimmed some of his cool. ideology after I started doing it, but that's not where I originated it from. I had heard a lot of people talking about it, just like and that. um, about probably twelve years ago, one guy that I was cool with told me that that's one way that he kind of gets his muscles to tighten up and shock his nerves and all that. And I never implemented it until mm-hmm. literally last summer. Mm-hmm. Um, but the point is, that's how I challenge. That's one of the things I incorporate to make sure I'm continuing to do uncomfortable things. Mm-hmm. So the answer to that question of maintaining that discipline and continuing to challenge yourself is making sure that you don't fall into a comfort zone. Because, you know, you fall into a comfort yeah. zone with something, you're going to get complacent, and then you're right. not really going to, you're going to kind of stay in this shell, in this uh this zone of not really progressing, but staying stagnant. Uh, stagnant. Yeah. yeah, and somewhat satisfying yourself with not necessarily doing anything hmm. bigger you know oh, right and that's not that's not really where to be yeah you know to play both sides of the coin though it's like could you are you maybe uh keeping yourself from being happy like no i mean take no, a, take no, a warm no, 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 shower no, no, no. You know that's not I mean? that's like, not all know, i do it's, 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 not, it's, it's like not like uh what is it uh like self-deprecating you no know? no 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 i actually it's, it's a lot of it is mental and oh, I actually yeah. got myself to a point like, where it's never easy to do, but it's a satisfying thing to do. Mm-hmm. When I'm done, I feel accomplished. Yeah. Like, it's to the point where now I've told myself that once the, the pain threshold doesn't stop when the workout stops, the pain threshold stops when I get out of that cold shower. Mm, right. But then when I'm done, um, you know, I feel confident. I'm happy about it. I feel, yeah. I feel accomplished. You know, I reward myself by, you know— Having accomplished that, basically, mm-hmm, that, you know, um, because I feel stronger. I can tell it's making a difference in my body composition, that type of thing. Mm-hmm. But I don't only take cold showers. Is, yeah, is I just it, make sure I take one at least. I probably take one at least five days a week. I mean, like, like a seven. good reminder, good, yeah. good mental Like reminder. control exactly. discomfort so when the uh, random discomfort of life hits you, you're better prepared. That's exactly what it is. Oh, very monastic. That's, no, that, okay. Very what? Monastic, like a monk. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that's a good word. Monastic. Yeah, yeah. That's um, cool. That's, but it's, yeah, it's, better, it's, better to hear than you're just like never letting yourself uh, have a good time. No, no, it's not. Because I, I know you, some workaholics who are like, it's like, come on, man. No, like, I mean, that that goes along with the ideology of having balance, too. I mean, mm-hmm. you we live in a hustle culture. Mm-hmm. And a lot of what comes along with that is being encouraged to deprive yourself of sleep and mm. i mean i'm i'm guilty of that right you know um to tell yourself i mean even the last time we met up i had a very terrible sleep pattern mm. i had a horrible sleep pattern i mean i'd be in the studio i have a home studio uh i'd be up in there working on stuff doing research on how to market my music mm-hmm. playlist hunting that type of thing or just straight up making making music and I'd fall asleep in that desk chair mm. and wake up the next morning at 3 a.m., go downstairs, make some tea or some coffee, come right back up and keep doing the same thing. Oh, I mean, there there have been weeks I've gone without sleeping in my bed. Right. You know, um, that's not healthy, you know. So you you do have to have balance. You have to reward yourself at times, which is what I was saying when we were off air. Is, mm-hmm. Yeah, I have a very balanced diet. I work out five, six days every, every week. Uh, five, six days a week. Every, every week. year. That sounded weird. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. um, but I have cheat days. You know, I'll eat some ice cream and some pizza or a burger or go to uh, In-N-Out when I go to California. Mm. You know what I mean? But I'm going to hit the hit the, hit the the weight super hard once I'm done and make sure mm. that I compensate for yeah, that. Deserve that. Yeah. Um, you balance know? it out. Exactly. So, no, I'm not only up here taking cold showers and right, absolutely yeah. no warm showers allowed. I yeah, mean, you're saying you have a uh, sweet tooth. Sorry to ask such a trivial question, but uh, <laughs> what what are you eating for sweets? What yeah. If it's, your, if it's uh, you say you got a weakness for it and you indulge yourself in it sometimes, it must be pretty tasty. What uh, yeah, What's the sweets um, you're eating? I like, I like that Tillamook ice cream. 
Oh. I don't know if y'all have ever seen that. They sell it in like liter, liter tubs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't eat a liter at a time. Uh-huh. Favorite. I look at, by the way, I look at labels and this here goes that discipline thing again. I look mm. at labels for every on everything I buy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so you know, I'll look and see what a serving size is of everything, okay. make sure I don't eat too much. And if I go overboard a little bit, whatever, it evens out. Um, mm. but I, I like that stuff, it's very creamy. Yeah. But mm. even with that said, when I when I cheat, I still look at ingredients. Mm-hmm. You know, I try to I try to stay away from soy, for example. Mm-hmm. You know, just because of the fact that it's it, it can produce estrogen. It's not good for men, that type of thing. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I mean, I still do things in moderation. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I said, if I do go overboard a little tiny bit, I just make sure I make up for it yeah, with making up for either it. what I eat the next day mm-hmm. or how hard I go when I hit the weights next. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But ice cream is one of them. Uh, I haven't had pizza, pizza, and cauliflower crust pizza. Hey, uh, that don't, that's good. That don't count, that's though. Good. That don't count. Um, but I haven't had Domino's or anything for right. a few months, but every once in a while I'll do that, you know, burger. Oh, this conversation is making me hungry. There you go. <laughs> Shit, my, my skip hungry. over to Soul Bowl and have, yeah. that, uh, have that cheat day early in the week yeah. oh after my. this. <laughs> I mean, with how busy you keep yourself, I mean, those rewards got to be important. Yeah, you know, it's got to kind of keep you, keep you moving, keep you driven. Mm-hmm. And I cook a lot too. Oh, okay. okay. So, I mean, to that point. That's another thing that makes me just that much more busy. Right. You I know? can uh, preparing and yeah. it sounds like going through the research of what you're putting into the body. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think as important of what's coming out of the body. It's yeah. Would you think that um a healthy diet, a healthy sleep schedule makes better art? Yeah. Yeah. And I was actually just about a good segue because I was about to just take like you took the words right out of my mouth. I mean it all comes full circle, you know, just as far as the way, you know, I heard somebody say how you do one thing is how you do all things, right? Mm. So when you, when you try to adopt a healthy lifestyle, you know, you try to live on kind of a more disciplined basis, you, I'm not the best at it, but you get better sleep, that type of thing. It has a ripple effect, you know, Um, and you will, at least for me, I do see it in when I make art. I can be a little bit more sharp. You know, I can focus a little bit more. Yeah. I can be a little bit more motivated to make music. Whereas if if any of that stuff is off, it's probably it's not going to have the best results in that sense. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm probably not going to really feel like making a song. Or I'm going to feel like I'm being forced to, or I'm, like I'm forcing myself to do it, that type mm-hmm. of thing. True, because true. my mind isn't sharp. I'm feeling sluggish. And then just from a purely physical aspect, being in shape helps with performance. Mm. I mean, I've been in not the best shape before and still been able to kill the stage, but I mean, right. your breath control gets that much better when you're in shape. Yeah. Mm. And I'll tell you what, the cold shower thing helps with that too. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But even, I mean, even just from a purely physical standpoint, mm. being outside in the cold without a coat on, I remember um, on Christmas Day, actually, I was selling something on Craigslist. And, uh, or off Craigslist. And uh, these dudes came by the house to pick the item up mm-hmm. and measure their vehicle. And so uh, they, I don't know how they, well, they figured it out. So mm-hmm. maybe that's why they didn't do it. But it was a big set of furniture and they okay. came in a Honda Civic. Uh, but because they had to kind of figure out how to deconstruct everything, strap it to the top of the car and everything like that we were outside. Yeah. And if y'all remember how cold it was this past Christmas, mm. we were outside for a really long time. Right, but I right. didn't even have a coat on. These dudes were struggling, snot all up in the nose, and I was I was good. Yeah, I was mm, cold, but mm, I could tell, I, could, I was conditioned, and I could tell that it was because of the fact that I've been practicing that since last June, mm. that my body just ad- adapted to it. Would you ever do a, like a polar bear plunge? Jumping in their frozen <laughs> legs. Oh, man, I don't know if I'm quite there yet. But <laughs> I've thought about it. I've thought of, I think the next thing for me would be the ice bath thing. Ice I want to try that. That's yeah. a good I want to try that. Yeah. Polar plunge. Uh, uh, I'm African, man. You know, I, they, got, I got African roots. So I mean, with the, I I'd say be, even uh, with the, the ice bath might even be more extreme because you're you're staying submerged in that versus just a dip but and come out. So what know? exactly does that entail? Because that is that something that takes place in the actual during the cold yeah. uh, season, like during the winter? Typically, okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean. And it'd be like sauna, jumping leg, sauna, jumping leg. Oh, sauna, jumping jump leg, sauna. Okay. Mm, perhaps, maybe, maybe. I mean, I do take cold showers now and it's winter time. So, yeah, yeah. possibly. Um, so, sorry to get back on. Oh, we only got a minute. What were you going to say? Oh, I was probably going to go through the releases you've dropped since we last talked with you. Yeah, so it was God and the Virgin and then um, Power Moves single came out. Yep. October 21. And uh, Proof was another single. Proof that was came January out. 25th or 20th or something like that. 2021. Yep. 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 And then uh, Boom, No Dogma. There you go. In uh, March. So those two were actually singles. Um, oh. The preceding singles on that album. Man. Okay. Power Moves we did. Um, we did Power Moves a long time ago. <laughs> but the video, you said October. It was October 2021. Yeah, so that was a few months before the album. Nice. And then Proof was like, what, three months later? Yeah. And then those both ended up on the album. Uh, so there's talk- Dogma, March. Uh, what is it? Do I have on there twelve tracks, thirteen tracks? Yep, thirteen tracks. Well, the the tro. We got to take a break, but we're talking about we're that talk right about afterwards. It. We're gonna talk so, about it. Dog Star, uh, KPW Hip Hop. We'll be right back. Man. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll be right back. And we're back, sitting down with KPW, diving right on in again to the conception and creation of No Dogma. No dogma. No uh, dogma. Re- released, uh, like you said, March of 2022. Yeah, March 17th, 2022, to be exact. And let me rattle off all the features here. Because oh, yes, man. Yes, yes, man. Pole, man. So, yeah, King Kamal, Spoken Poet. Mm-hmm. Uh, is it LT? No, oh, DTR Seth? Is that how you say that one? I'm going to be honest. I think so. Real Smooth, Rich Garvey, V's Riddles, Lieutenant yep. Sonny, uh, Faino the God. Faino the God. And yeah. Juice Lord, E B the M C Niles. Yep. What up, Niles? Way of Zone, <laughs> Cassiopeia, Landscapes, Vinnie Crooks, uh Holy moly. Lyrical Collage. Lyrical collage. And uh yeah. Cel- of six five one Genesis. C- C- Celicia B. Celicia B. Shout out That's to every wild. last one of them. That's on all on one project. All on one project and about ten of them are on one song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that. it. Yeah. yeah, the twelve minute bruise. closer. Yeah, Ooh. bruise. That's um, nice. No dogma, man. And part of the reason why that was able to get so many features is because that was that project was about two years, two and a half years in the making. Yeah. So I started it probably when did I release God and Virgin? August of 2019. So the day so after that, <laughs> nah, 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 nah. <laughs> in the I wouldn't have been. That would be cold. very characteristic of me, but right. in the cold shower, right? But um, probably a few months, probably about two months after um the release of God and the Virgin, No Dogma recording started. Whoa. So uh, October 2019, first track was Power Moves, mm. and I went from there. So there, I mean, there was a lot. I mean. Throughout that process came what we talked about last mm-hmm. time, the whole thing of restructuring stuff. Yeah. Scrapping old verses, Oof. making them more digestible, rewriting, re-recording. I mean, there was a lot of restructuring of mm-hmm. everything across the board. Um, and then fast forward two years, we were ready to release a newly, newly structured, different approach of a project. Um, huh. uh, the concept no dogma basically is one that, ba- that goes against dogma for lack yeah. of better words but meaning that old teachings that we might have been brought up on up, up, applying differently for different people obviously um but from my my experience i could say that certain things that i was taught growing up were antiquated and not necessarily the only way that you can apply to life mm, you know right, an example right. is for instance, the ad, the advent of social media, bringing about different paths of success and um, career paths that people could take, not necessarily following a traditional path, not just through the advent of social media, mm-hmm. but just because of the fact that technology as a whole is developed to a point where people can attain what I would assume is ideally wealth to them or... Mm-hmm success as they define it a different way yeah, from right. what we talked about last time just going to school yeah getting a 
degree, getting a job, starting a family, and dying, mm-hmm. right? We talked about that yeah, last time. Week. Right. And the four walk, I, I forgot that last time, too. <laughs> but there yeah, you go. With the social, it's just there's, you know, you probably see 10, 10 posts a day of someone trying to sell you a dream, though. Yeah, and, you know, the balance of getting, you know, the balance of not getting overwhelmed by that and being inundated by information and, you know, overloaded mm-hmm. is... Again, comes back full circle, gets, emphasizes the importance of balance, right? Not picking up the phone on your pillow as soon as you roll over when you wake up, that type mm-hmm. of thing. But knowing how to utilize those tools, yeah. right? So to bring it back to no dogma, fighting against dogmatic principles in terms of the finger wagging do this this way don't argue don't don't question don't question rules with no evidence you yeah. have rules yeah follow rules that don't particularly provide any backing or evidence these are the guidelines follow them shut up conform mm. which is what the school system amongst other things teaches you to do teaches you to be an employee don't independently think and remain on the straight and narrow and be a peg in the machine mm. and serve the higher purpose of society that ultimately doesn't give a an F about yeah, you. Thanks for not swearing. Yeah. Uh, I almost did. With uh with the production of mm-hmm. No Dogma, where did the the beat hunt begin? I mean it was the beat sure. hunt in internally. All, All in here, baby. Yes. And so All in here. Yes. So I'm sure creating more beats than you needed to, selecting from those mm-hmm. and then making more tracks than you needed to for the album yeah, and then yeah. selecting from those. For sure. How how do you weed out uh, a good or a or a bad beat in this case? Like, I liked everything I made. Yeah, but part of the part of what made it impossible impossible part of what made it limiting, I should say, mm-hmm. was the sample clearance factor. Oh, mm-hmm. right. I didn't I didn't use samples on everything, mm-hmm. but for the songs I did, I couldn't get some of them cleared in time. Okay. You know, so, for example, I had one song that I did with uh with AKA Kobe that I really wanted to put on the album just mm-hmm. because I loved the beat, I loved his verse, I loved my verse mm-hmm. verses because I had two on there, and the the melody was a nostalgic sounding sounding melody to yeah. me. Um, it sounded like something I grew up on mm-hmm. in Northern Virginia when I was a kid. And so, I mean, just because of those different aspects of it, I really wanted to put it on there, but I couldn't get a hold of the people who own the material in right. time to be able to get it cleared and legitimately put it on there. Because yeah. that's another thing that came along with a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about is I've been wanting to go about things the right way. Yeah, what is the right way to clear a sample? I mean, it depends on what the... um what the contact method is for the person that owns the music, how easy it is to find the owners of the music, mm-hmm. whether it's a part of a music library or whether it's, uh, you know, a piece of recent music that was released as, you know, uh, an accessible um, set of sounds or whatever. But basically, with the one that I did clear, that I did have to clear, I had to get in contact with a an account manager. Mm. It was a song that was part of it was that wasn't intended for general public use. So you ever heard of KPM, for example? I don't believe so. It's KPM is I think it's considered a record label, mm. but they basically made music that was part of that would be considered part of a, a music library. Mm. Okay. And so a lot of the songs were parts of scores of old movies from the seventies and that Ooh, type of thing. Okay. So they were like purely public domain or they not, weren't, maybe they not weren't yet. public domain. Yeah. Um, because I don't think any of the songs are that old. I mean, that's part that's yeah. part of what considers something the public domain. Um, but but to your point, public domain would be free for use. Precisely, right? yeah. Um, these weren't that. These were the types of songs that you would go to a library, like a physical library, mm-hmm. and you know, pull a record out and listen to it in the library. But it wasn't something that you would, you know, go and buy at the store on a vinyl and then throw it on your record player. Okay. But then later on, they they became available for public consumption, but they still have an owner. Mm. So what I had to do was, I don't even remember how I even found how to get in contact. I think I basically just 
looked up the artist, and then, oh, I think it was BMI Rep- Repertoire. Okay. okay. BMI Repertoire is uh, a, a website that allows you to search for anybody who own to search for any piece of music that is out there and identify who owns it. Mm-hmm. Cool. You know, who owns certain shares of whatever pieces mm-hmm. of music, the percentage, et cetera, et cetera. And so I had to look up the artist, figure out who to get in contact with, because sometimes there'd be a contact number. Right. right. Got into um got in touch with an account manager. And I probably spent a total of like three hours on the phone with him just going through everything. Mm, signing, wow. getting paperwork from them and understanding the agreements and then deciding on the percentages. Hmm. And so the agreement was, you know, we, <clears throat> I pay the upfront fee to clear the sample. Mm-hmm. It um, gets agreed upon how we're going to split it. And then going forward, it, you know, once it plays or gets a certain number of streams and there's a particular percentage that gets broken off and we, also sign an agreement for if there's ever a, um, what's the word I'm looking for, a placement, mm. you know, how it's going to be split up, that mm-hmm. type of thing. So it's a somewhat complex process, but he, the reason we spent so much time on the phone was so that he could break it down and make it as understandable as possible. Yeah. I and mean, I still don't, trust, now you'll know still don't trust these cats like uh-huh. that, but, you know, I just tried to pr- push for as much transparency as possible. And yeah. how many tracks on the on the project I think, do have samples? I w- oh, do have samples? Just the one. Just nice. the one? Okay. Just the one. Um, I think there's 13 songs total, including Tro. But right. of uh, those 13, 13. songs, uh, your representative sent over two of them. One of them kind of being the intro to yeah, the project. True. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's we, I love that you picked that as one of the two tracks. Hey man, it sets the mood. It sets skeletal, the vibe. Skeletal, simple. You know, minimal. Yeah. You want to get into how that came about? Please. Yeah. All right. Well, I have a song on there called Lane. And when I was making the beat for that, I noticed somewhat of a rhythm in the background that kind of came about as a result of everything I had done to it. Mm-hmm. And so I started I started harmonizing based on how that sounded. If you notice, if you listen to Lane, you'll hear that. Mm. And then so what I did is I just took that that harmony. I mean, I literally harmonized with my own voice and That's, pitched it up and everything because right. I, I can't sing. You know, um, but then I took that, pitched it up, and then just looped it oh. and made Tro out of that. Wow. Because what I wanted to do was not just have some standard intro with a, you know, a rap verse or two, mm-hmm. you know, it's essentially a following a template. Or, yeah. Not that there'd be anything wrong with that, but I wanted mm-hmm. to do something different. So yeah. um, kind of trying to respect the need to adjust to people's attention spans and how they digest music yeah. these days, you know, not having something too long. It's probably like 40 seconds or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, But I decided to take that, loop it in the beginning to kind of introduce and ease people into the album. And then if they made it all the way through, get to that other song and then hear it referenced. Yeah. Because I'm big on transitions and themes on albums. Yeah, it's like an an overture in a musical. Exactly, exactly. Leave these little hints. Exactly. These musical hints. Yep. So it really originated technically from a song that is later in the album. Yeah. And at the time, I didn't have an intro yet. Okay. So I figured, okay, well, this is perfect timing. This all fits together. We'll throw this on the intro. Yeah. We'll set the tone for the album. It's ambient. And then it'll go right into the first song. Yeah, I think a, a perfect uh, self-reference. I love when you're for hearing sure. similar sounds and, and similar And you experiment. It, yeah. it teaches you to experiment. It keeps you on your toes. You know what I mean? Very cool. Well, let's dive super, super deep into uh, the song song, Guard. Guard, man. That's the fourth track off the album. That is track number four, correct? Yeah, yeah. tell us all about that song. So you had the beat. Did yep. you write the verse before? Uh, what did I do? We got about two minutes. Did I write the... Man, I don't even remember. It was so long ago. <laughs> um, But I made... The song came about probably around April of 2020. So like a month into the pandemic. And I think I actually wrote my verse after the guest feature on there did. Oh, okay. Um, okay. And that was actually a song that was restructured too. So the beat didn't even start out the way that it is, that it that the finished product uh, presents. Really? But EB, the MC, is an artist from Canada. Okay. An MC from, from, I think, Toronto. I want to say Toronto. And I made the beat and sent it to him. And I was like, yo, here's the concept. You know, we're just essentially going to approach this, talking about, 
you know, vultures and people who attack your energy. Yeah. So just write a verse, write a little 16 or is that word little again? I try not mm. to use the word little. It <laughs> minimizes the art. But write a, write a 16 just to addressing your perspective of how you guard your energy. So that's mm -hmm. exactly what he did. Um, I didn't even have the name guard for it at the time. Mm. It's funny, but that was always the concept. Wrote a verse probably a few months later, recorded it, scrapped it, rewrote the entire thing for that same reason of song structure, yeah. digestibility and all that. Interesting. Change the beat. And because I changed the beat, I had to re-record it again oh, to fit the God. new beat, which wasn't, I mean, it was a fun process. Yeah, oh yeah. But it came together and that's what we have now. Oh, wow. And there's merch for that too. The guard merch. There you go. Oh, I love He's that. He's seen it, he hasn't. Yeah, I do yeah. not think I have. No, yeah. no, that's yeah. sweet. Yeah. yeah, it's on the website. I got it on my Instagram too. Was that like one of the first uh, singles off of it, or why does that have merch versus <laughs> well, the whole album? I was shooting a video for it uh, that I haven't actually released yet. And you're shooting videos, editing videos, writing the music videos now too, yeah, man. Yeah, I'm you doing need, all that. You need so, to start. So yeah. there is going to be a video for that. It's not done. Um, it's not edited fully right. yet but it's that will come but, but yeah. that was the main reason why i printed the shirt out because i wanted to wear it during the video and then i made it available as merch well we really Apparel. we really want to thank Apparel. you again for sitting down with us and again taking the time to give us a peek behind the curtain sure. give us a check for in sure it was, it was keep, fun yeah keep we doing what you're doing time. absolutely appreciate y'all this is dog star <laughs>